This is STEM in 30. This is STEM in 30. This is STEM in 30. What are you doing? Today is our 50th show. Just think, we've said this is STEM in 30 50 times. That's true, and we have been on aircraft carriers and taken rides in hot air balloons. We've ridden in Model Ts and in race cars. We've done magic, science, and art. And I've worn just about every goofy hat or costume that you can imagine, all in an effort to bring real-world science into your classrooms. There's only one problem. What's that? We have not said this is STEM in 30, 50 times. Yeah, this is our 50th show. I counted twice. Ask Ryan. That means we've said this is STEM in 30, 49 times. Oh. This, this is, is STEM, STEM in 30. I'm Marty and I'm Beth and today we are coming to you from the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in Washington DC. Today is our 50th show and we are really excited to share with you some of the ways that STEM subjects are used in real life. If you like what you see here today head on over to Facebook or Twitter and give us a follow. We would love to hear how you use the museum's resources in your classroom. As we work on these shows we have a couple of guiding principles that we keep coming back to. First, we want to get students really excited about STEM topics. If you enjoy learning about something, it's not going to feel like work. It's important for us to help students meet people and learn about careers they might not have thought about. For instance, did you know that a linguist developed an entire language for the Star Trek series? It's also important for us to take students to places they may never get a chance to go. Taking a middle school student to the deck of an aircraft carrier probably isn't going to happen, but we went there and we can share the intensity and the awe that we felt with you. Let's jump right into it today and talk about science, the S in STEM. We get to do a lot of great hands-on science here on STEM in 30, and we look for things that you might do in your classroom, but we supersize them. One of the things we do is have experts help us out. NASA astronaut Kate Rubens is a huge science nerd, and I say that with a great deal of respect. A lot of times when you think about astronauts, you think about fighter pilots, Top Gun, the right stuff. Kate wasn't any of those before becoming an astronaut. She was a research scientist. She has degrees in molecular biology and cancer biology. She is crazy smart. During her trip to the International Space Station, she became the first person to ever sequence DNA in space. When she got back here to Earth, we did a simple DNA extraction experiment with her right here. When we write our scripts, we typically write them so that we run the experiment and the astronaut, we just ask them questions. But not with Kate. She jumped right in, took over, not only explaining each step of the experiment, but also connecting the experiment to what she did in space. Check this out. This is Kate Rubens. She's a NASA astronaut of Expeditions 48 and 49. Before becoming an astronaut, Kate was a scientist. And while in space, her and her crew worked on over 275 different science experiments. Kate, you were the first person to sequence DNA in outer space. Can you tell us a little bit about that experiment? Yeah, so we were looking at uh, new technologies, actually, to determine the sequence of DNA in space. And so we used a small portable sequencer. It's about the size of your cell phone to actually determine the sequence of DNA. But before you can determine the sequence of DNA, you actually have to extract the DNA, right? It's, it's inside the cells and you gotta pull it out of the cells. So what do we have going on here? So it looks like we've got an experiment. We're gonna use peas here. Uh, so, so peas are actually a multicellular organism. They've got DNA inside them. So you've got DNA inside you, but these peas have some DNA inside them and we're gonna get this DNA out of the peas here. So one of the first things that we're gonna do is mix the peas with some cold water. And the next thing we're gonna do is add a little bit of salt. And so that helps equilibrate our mixture and helps get some of that DNA out of the membrane. And that water helps get the DNA into solution. 
At the peas, the cells inside the peas, they all have a membrane, right? They've got some fiber. That's why everybody says eat peas. It's good vegetables for you. But we got to get rid of this membrane and this fire, fiber in terms of uh, getting the DNA from the inside. So one thing that we're going to do that we've done here already is actually mix the peas with some detergent. And we'll let that, we'll let that kind of settle. And the next thing we're going to do is add a little bit of meat tenderizer. And we'll stir this. And uh, then one of the ways that we can pull out DNA or precipitate DNA uh, is actually with a little bit of rubbing alcohol. So the DNA is in a water solution here. This, we added water earlier. This is an aqueous solution. And when you add alcohol, it actually makes two different fractions. And so what that does is it helps us precipitate the DNA. All the DNA joins together, right? Because uh, it, it, it wants to, to cluster together and we can use that to grab all that DNA together and hopefully we'll grab enough DNA together that we can actually see it. So I'll pour this into a glass here. And we didn't do this kind of thing on space station during my expedition, but we actually are flying some experiment hardware. It doesn't do it with a blender and some peas. It's actually some biological hardware that's gonna do things like uh, lyse the cells and denature the DNA so that we can look at DNA extraction on board the space station. So I'll pour in the rubbing alcohol, and we'll pour this in slowly here. You can start to see it separating. Yeah, so you can see these two layers that we've got here. So you see all this cloudy stuff? That's actually the DNA, so it's starting to precipitate. And we'll let that, we'll let that kind of settle. So uh, you want to let the DNA gather together, and, then, and essentially we've, we've broken open the cells. We've released the DNA, and then we've done this alcohol water mixture to separate the DNA and make it clump together. So let's take a look. It looks like we actually have a pretty good DNA mixture here. So we'll see if we can stir this around, and it looks like we can get a pretty good spool here. And it's, this is kind of gross. You guys are going to love this when you do it in the classroom. It does look like a big ball of snot here. <laughs> but you can really see the strands. But you can strands. see all the strands of the DNA. And so these strands of DNA are microscopic, but when you get a huge amount clustering together, you can actually see the DNA. So if we were going to do this in a lab, the next thing we would do is put this in a centrifuge, and we'd spin it really hard so that all the DNA gathers together and forms a pellet. We can then clean up that pellet, and then we could put it into a sequencing reaction. Wow. Kate, thank you so much. If you want to learn how to do this experiment in your classroom, be sure to check out our website. We are talking about the acronym STEM. A lot of times it gets lumped together to just mean science, but it means so much more than that. We have learned about some amazing technology. Oftentimes the ideas for this come from interesting places. Jared Leidick came up with an idea of the saber that was used on Alan Eustace's world record skydive. This was a thing that took the drogue chute and put it away from Alan so it didn't get tangled in the really thin atmosphere. On the other hand, sometimes new technology starts by looking around your own environment. That's what Aaron Parness and a team of people at the Jet Propulsion Lab did when they came up with an idea on how to capture satellites. They looked at feet specifically the feet of geckos. <laughs> wow, that is really, really cool. I'm joined by Dr. Aaron Parness. He is at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. What do you do there? Yeah, so we build all different kinds of wall climbing robots, like the one you just saw. This one is inspired by cockroaches. How is it inspired by cockroaches? <laughs> so on the wheels, it has sharp hooks. Okay. And those are similar to the sharp spines that cockroaches have on the bottoms of their legs. And why, why cockroaches and not like spiders or? Yeah, so cockroaches are really amazing because they have such a small brain, but they're still able to climb. So their feet are not doing any thinking, they're just flailing around and they still work. And so it's a mechanical intelligence is what we call it. And it's not just cockroaches that inspire your work either, because you've got some other things here that I know have 
been inspired by other yes. uh, animals. So I would say geckos are probably nature's most amazing climber. And they climb using lots of tiny hairs, nanoscopic hairs on the bottoms of their feet. And you have an example here. Is this, can you show us yeah. how it works? So this is a thousand times the size of our robotic gecko hairs. It's about a hundred thousand times the size of what a gecko can grow on its feet. And if you put this on the surface and push it, you'll see that only the tips are making contact. But if I pull in the preferred direction, you see it's got a high real area of contact and it's sticky. So geckos do this as they climb, where they weight their foot um, to make it sticky and then release that weight and they can take the foot off. They do that 10 times a second. If you were trying to climb with duct tape, it might be sticky enough, but you know, how do you get it off? So why is NASA interested in this? Yeah, there's lots of applications. We wanna grab satellites to service them, repair them, refuel them. There's also a lot of space garbage that we'd like to grab onto and move out of the way. Um, or you can envision a robot that would crawl around on the outside of the space station doing inspection and repair. Do you wanna show us how this works? Yeah, absolutely. This is an example of a gripper we sent to the space station. The astronauts tested it. If you squeeze together, it's loading up these springs and that'll put the adhesive in its preferred state, so it's sticky. And then if you squeeze together again, it comes off. Now, this is the same material that's on this and I don't feel hairs or anything on here. That's right, it's too small to feel with your hand um, and it's a geometric effect. So it's not sticky to the touch like tape or glue. It's using van der Waals forces, which are uh, this uh, small force between molecules that get really close together. It's incredible that the gecko uh, came up with this idea. Dean Kamen is an amazing engineer and inventor and the founder of FIRST Robotics. If you want your students to be involved in robotics and engineering, check out FIRST. Engineer and inventor Kurt Westergaard also gave us a handy little tip about carrying around a sketchbook. I'm joined by Kurt Westergaard. Kurt, thank you so much for being here today with us. It's my pleasure. Good morning. Kurt, you have a really unique job. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your company and what you guys do? Uh, happy to. It's unique and it's fun. Um, I fly tethered aerostats, which uh, really means a very large balloon that's on a rope. Uh, we usually fly it above cities to take uh, architectural engineering, uh, photography, and other types of payloads. Most of the equipment we need, for example, we often are looking at omni antennas, which are antennas that cover in a big circle. And uh, to put that up in the sky, you really have to be lightweight. So this is something that uh, is the beginning of that. It's, uh, it's got to be light, it's got to be strong, and in this particular one, it's got to let the wind go right through it, otherwise it flaps around. Um, and under a balloon, the radio frequency, which is what all of your cell phones are, they're all off now, but when they're turning on, they often go through an antenna like this. And it needs to sit level, and it's really hard to get something to sit level when it's uh, floating around on an ocean of air. So how do you get it to sit level? Yeah, so it right now it, it's going to wobble like this, and um, that's not always the greatest thing. It's got to sit dead level, so in this animation, which was done by drawing it in a sketchbook, then drawing it in SketchUp, and then sending it to an automatic printer. So we put one of those pistons on here, and it, it worked pretty well. When you're thinking about this stuff, you don't just go out and build it. First, you, you do some sketches. So you've got sketchbooks here. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about how important drawing is Right, for you? so drawing is really a way of thinking, and it's, it's diagramming, it's getting a, uh, a problem organized in a way that you can take it apart. So it's not as much art as it is thinking. And when I start something like that, uh, I'll, this particular one, and I'm just calling that the antenna, um, I'll, that's the finished shape, but I'll start off by asking, um, gee, it really needs to have a long straight part to it, and then it's got to have a, a stamper at the bottom. And by the way, if you build that out of ballistic nylon, like I'm doing it here, you're going to have a weak spot here and there. So if you look in history, there's always been weak spots in tall, skinny things. Look at the Eiffel Tower, for example, which has taken that same T shape and spread the legs really wide apart uh, with a 3D printer. That's quite easy to do. So it gets that support uh, laterally, yet it's got that um, holiness, uh, that transparency 
as my mother's potato mashing <laughs> tool. So you, you actually draw inspiration from just everyday objects. I, I do, and I think all of you do. It's, if you want to explain something, you know, uh, it was, um, for example, it, it had a shape that was like something else. Um, sly as a fox, you know, you think of a fox and sly. So I encourage you to sketch, but also to sketch the similes, the metaphors, and the things that it's like. So it's not completely drawing, it's a little mixture of a description, very specific descriptions for patents, but also its function. Uh, you already know how to do that when you tell a story. So just get that in paper and you're on your way to uh, unique ideas. You mentioned earlier that it is important for us to virtually take students to places they may never get a chance to go. That included the deck of an aircraft carrier. We flew out to the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower on a C-2 Greyhound. We went from 100 miles an hour to zero in two seconds. After we landed on the deck, we learned about the amazing things that the crew does on a daily basis. We also learned about the math required to land on an aircraft carrier. It all starts with the math that you learn in middle school. Now, once you've landed on an aircraft carrier, a day or so later, you have to leave the aircraft carrier. Actually, you have to launch off the aircraft carrier. One of us screamed the entire time. Check this out. Math really is everywhere, even going from zero to 165 in three seconds. I wasn't really thinking about math at that point. I was just glad we weren't dead and someone else had taken care of all of the math. One thing I noticed on the launch was that Marty has the ability to reach a really high pitch. And did you know that pitch is related to frequency and math? Our friend Doc Nix, the director of the Green Machine Pep Band at the George Mason University. And one of the grooviest people that we have ever met. Demonstrates the connection between math and music. I'm Doc Nix. I'm the director of the Green Machine at George Mason University. Musical notes are tones. Tones are sound waves that have a specific frequency. Frequency describes the number of waves that pass a fixed place in a given amount of time. Listen to this note. This is the note's sound wave. In one second, sound moves 1,100 feet. Frequency measures the number of waves that happen in that space. The fewer the waves, the lower the frequency, the lower the note. The more waves, the higher the frequency, the higher the note. We have been playing with notes and harmonies for most of human history. Harmony is when two or more notes sound good together. But most tones don't sound good together. Getting two instruments in tune with each other was a big challenge. Way back in the day, if I made an instrument and you made an instrument, the note you call A and the note that I call A probably didn't match. So people got together to agree on standard notes. The note known as A was fixed to a frequency of 440 hertz. And then all the other notes on the 12 tone scale were based on that note. Today, that standard is known as A440. All the instruments you know are designed to be fixed to this standard. An interesting math fact about musical frequencies is that if you double the frequency of a note, you get the octave of that note. This occurs naturally. This isn't something human beings made up. If you start with A440 and then play the same note up one octave, that's A880. Next day up is 1760. Next day is 3520. 
melody, and harmony combine into a complex mathematical web of frequencies, making beautiful music together. We just saw that math and music intersect, but so do the other arts. I'm an artist as well as a STEM educator, and some of the sciencey things we see here around the museum inspire me. Like the amazing photos that Juno sent back from Jupiter, they inspired me to do a painting. It's really cool. Scientists and engineers are creative and artistic. Every day they are looking at our world and beyond in different and creative ways. That's the way science works. You take something and you look at it in a way you haven't looked at it before. And a lot of them incorporate their artistic talents into their scientific work. Here is a look at the intersection of the arts and sciences. Tell me about the process from beginning to end of designing and building a kite. Figure out kind of a, a picture and, and then I go for a structure. And one of the new parts of kite flying is flying indoors. And we have in front of us one of the oldest flying objects in the Smithsonian collection. What's going on on the table? Sure, so we're in the process of manufacturing a new balloon right now. Where do the designs come from? Honestly, the imagination is your limit. We can build basically any shape. Today, these mathematicians and artists are going to help us enlarge a painting by Alan Bean. The arts are so important that this year is the year of music at all of the Smithsonian Institution museums. Music and STEM intersect a lot. Jared, the lead engineer on the world record skydive, is a talented musician. Chell Lindgren played bagpipes in space. And you already saw how amazing Doc Nix is. He even learned to play piano at his aunt's house. Her son, Doc's cousin, was Fred Gregory, and he was the first African-American commander of a space shuttle. A couple of years ago, I got a chance to work with Randy Comrade Bresnik. This was before he became a crew member and eventually commander of the International Space Station. He invited us to Houston before his launch to the station so that we could do some filming with him for a series we call ISS Science. These short videos connect hands-on, classroom-friendly experiments to the real-world science being done 250 miles above the Earth. Since then, we've had an opportunity to work with a lot of other astronauts to bring real-world science to your classroom. I think my favorite may have been when I got a chance to jam with Scott Tingle. And as you know, I love it when I can bring up the vacuum pump. Those peeps were delicious. Here's a look at ISS Science. Hello, I'm astronaut Randy Comrade Bresnik. I'm here with my friends Marty and Beth at the National Air and Space Museum. Comrade spent six months living and working on the International Space Station. Before his flight, we worked with him on connecting what you do in your classroom to what goes on on the International Space Station. And now that I'm back from space, I've got some of my fellow astronauts to continue to show you how everyday science, stuff that you do in your classroom, connects to what we do in space. So watch ISS Science. Now there's nothing I like more than creating a vacuum chamber with an astronaut. Yeah, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> so you have to, to learn to live in an environment where there is no gravity. If you've got a Bunsen burner in your classroom or something else that you can heat this with, it allows you to be able to see the roots as they grow, and then you just hang these in your classroom. You it does look like a big ball of snot here. <laughs> but you can really see the strands. But you can strands. see all the strands of the DNA. Three, two, one, launch! People at the top of their field, astronauts, engineers, scientists, and pilots, all have one thing in common. They all have a unique path to how they got to where they are. We've also learned that they are ordinary people who do extraordinary things. One of the most interesting stories we have heard is that of Shasta Ways. My name is Shasta Ways. I'm the founder and president of DreamStore Incorporated. I'm currently flying solo around the world in a single-engine Beechcraft Bonanza to help inspire the next generation of science, technology, engineering, and math professionals. A little bit about my background. Uh, my family and I came from Afghanistan as refugees in 1987 during the Afghan-Soviet War. And I grew up in a family uh, with five other sisters, so six girls at home. 
and I just thought to myself, I'm probably going to get married at a young age and have a big family like my mom did. And it wasn't until I found aviation where my life completely changed. My educational background is quite interesting because I grew up uh, very unmotivated, I grew up in a very underprivileged school district, and I just had no um, passion for education. And when I found aviation, all of that changed for me. And it was because of aviation I started to take more higher advanced math courses. My advice to middle school students is that no matter how far or unattainable your dreams may seem, they are very well within reach. And I remember thinking to myself that I'd love to be a pilot, but it's something that girls from Afghanistan don't do. And once I got past this way of thinking, and, and I just kind of looked at myself not as a Afghani woman, but I looked at myself as a person who has desires, who is just equal to any person out there in the world, um, and is equal to those who have accomplished many great things. As I started to think that way, I started to accomplish a lot more. And my big ad advice um, to middle school students is that approach life the way pilots do. Um, that when you're sitting in the airplane, the airplane doesn't know who you are, what your background is, but it propels you forward. One thing I've learned is with every failure, it's not really failure, it's just uh, a way of the universe telling you this is not the direction you're supposed to go to. And in, instead of giving up whenever you come across failures or setbacks, just tell yourself this is not how it's supposed to be and, and look for another solution. Um, imagine for those uh, pioneers in the past, if they would have just given up at the first sign of failure, what sort of life would we be living in? We've gotten a chance to go to some amazing places and meet some amazing people in an effort to bring real world science into your classroom. Let's take a quick look at some of those incredible people and places. Now I'm joined by astronaut Chell Lindgren. Thank you so much for being here. Today I'm here with astronaut Reed Weissman. I'm joined by astronaut Stephanie Wilson, a veteran of three space shuttle flights. Today we are joined by Dr. Peter Jacob, chief curator here at the National Air and Space Museum. I'm joined by Rod Roddenberry, the son of Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek. Are we ready to take a ride? Hey, let's go. Okay. This is the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. I'm at the New Mexico Museum of Space History. Today I'm at the Richmond International Raceway. And now I'm joined by Ivanka Trump. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us today. Oh my gosh, I am so excited. We are right smack dab in the path of totality. This is gonna be so cool. Marty thought it'd be a really great idea to take a ride in an actual helicopter. I am joined by Michael Collins, who flew on Gemini 10 and Apollo 11. Let's take a look at Neil Armstrong's suit. I am NASA astronaut Shane Kimbrough. I'm joined by Tim Coper. I'm joined by Alan Houston, the holder of the world record skydive. I'm in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. We're joined by Walter Cunningham, who flew on Apollo 7. Thank you so much for talking with us. Today we are joined by NASA astronaut and medical doctor Michael Barrett. I'm joined today by Buzz Carpenter, who's a docent here at the Udvar-Hazy Center, but also flew the SR-71, thank you so much for joining us today. Beth, it's my pleasure to be here. We have reached the end of our 50th episode. If you've missed any of them, head over to our archive to check them all out. Remember, they are always free, and we would love to hear how you are using them in your classrooms. If you make mission patches like our friend at Hunting Tower School in Australia, or bunny habitats like John Kerr Elementary in Virginia, send them our way. We would love to see them. You can always follow us on Twitter and Facebook and get the latest updates. And the occasional pun. And this season, after each show, we have followed it up with a mission debrief, an expert on the topic answering student questions. This month, teachers, it's all about you. We know how hard you work, and we hope that STEM and 30 and the National Air and Space Museum can bring some great resources into your classrooms. Join us one week from today as we have Lisa Pitts joining us. She is an amazing teacher in Oklahoma who is a member of the inaugural class of the Teacher Innovator Institute, teacher professional development from here at the National Air and Space Museum. 
Applications are now open for you to apply for this year's Teacher Innovator Institute. Lisa will be sharing some of the resources from here at the museum that you can use in your classrooms as well as answering some of your questions. We would like to thank Boeing for bringing you this show today. We'd also like to thank all of you for watching. Thanks for watching. This, this is <laughs> four. <laughs> four. <laughs> We've ridden in Model Ts and in race cars. You don't know your other. No, I don't. Bam. Bunny habitats. Bunnies. I love bunnies. Bunny, 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 bunny. We've reached the end of our 50th episode. And I haven't been <laughs> killed yet. That's the amazing <laughs> thing.